Hello, good morning. I'm here to talk about Terranode um, and how that's going to help us raise block size. Big blocks. Big blocks is what we want, right? And Terranode is our strategy, our plan for transitioning from the current block size we have to uh, larger blocks. Uh, what is Terranode? Terranode is Bitcoin server software that has been rebuilt from the ground up for enterprise and scale. Now, when I say that, rebuilt from the ground up, I often get the question from people, what, there's so much code there already, what, are you gonna rewrite all the code? That's not what I mean by rebuilt from the ground up. Rebuilding from the ground up is starting looking at customers, looking at the roles that customers play within the, within, uh, within the software, what roles they need, um, what services they need to provide. And it goes on to doing functional requirement analysis. How, what roles need what, right? There are different requirements for different, uh, different roles. A miner has a different priorities than a payment processor. And once we, once we know these, we can account for them in the software. Writing actually actual code comes later. And yes, we will reuse a lot of the Bitcoin SV code. Definitely, because that, it's there, it makes sense. Most important, of course, is the context, right? Terranode blocks, we're talking about 50,000 transactions per second, big blocks, big transactions. These are fundamental things that impact the design and architecture of the software. Okay, the current software has issues because the fundamental design there is of one megabyte block, right? Now we're fixing these in their current software, but from internal node, we'll have that from the beginning. The architecture for Terra node, we're taking a big data approach, not monolithic system, but microservices with messaging between them. Each service accomplishes a very specific task. Each service can be um, multiple instances of the service running so that they can spread the load between them. We will be leveraging existing components. What that refers to is, for example, a transaction store. We're not going to design a new database. We're going to use existing databases where possible. Um, and it's designed for high ability. Not 24 by 7, but all year round, rolling upgrades, live configuration. That's what this software is designed to do. It's designed to never go down. So this is the more interesting part for me. This is about the, the, the principles for Terranode, how they differ from the existing node software. The small world network. The small world network refers to how the node connects to every peer, not just eight or 10 peers, but all of them. This will be built into the software. It will, can reach out to every single peer and connect to them. Um, of course, it's configurable, right? Some people might not want that, but others will. If we take the case of a miner, the most important job for a miner is to propagate blocks, the, the tip of the chain. They need to, if they mine the block themselves, they need to get that block out everywhere um, so that other people, particularly to miners, so other people mine on top of it. If they have received a block from somewhere else and they're starting to mine on it, they have the same concern. They want everyone else to mine on it too. They want to stay on the same chain, right? The small world network, yeah, there's this term that we use about block propagation, right? With a small world network, it's not block propagation anymore. It's block transmission. You send it immediately to every node. You don't have to wait for one node to pass it on to the other, to the other, to the other. The small world network also has a lot of other impacts. Uh, think of zero conf. Um, if you have a payment processor who's pulling in transactions from every peer, how can it get confused about double spends? Because it sees every transaction that is there already. Of course, the small world network is an ideal situation, right, where you connect to every single peer. And um, there are some, uh, there will be some node operators who do not allow connections, for example, so it's not a 100% solution. 
but it's, a, um, it's, it's something to aim at. The blockchain is a tree. This one is one of my pet peeves. Um, it's not a list, right? It's not a list of blocks. It's a tree of blocks. Every block can have one parent. Every block can have multiple children. This goes, follows down to the, um, the next two topics too, block relativism. Everything is related to the block upon which at the tip. A transaction is valid relative to that block. Um, the UTX set is relative to that block. It's, everything is related to the block. When you validate a transaction in the system, uh, a Terra node is designed to tag that uh, the validation message with the block ID so that with latencies in the system, um, you can tell for which block it's valid. Tracking all of the active chain tips. Right now, the software is very, it treats, it treats the blockchain like a, like a list, right? Um, if there is a uh, reorganization, so if there are multiple chain tips and the chain tip that, you, that you're not currently on wins, then there's this whole complex process of reorganization to, to switch to the other one. If you, if Terminal will check all of the chain tips, that is all of the recent ones, right? All of the recently active chain tips, it will t track. For a miner to switch from one chain tip to another is just, a, is, is, is then simple because they already have all of the chain tips. They don't have to download it, they already have them all. Transaction validity. Um, it's generally linked into one topic within the Bitcoin node. You check that the transaction is valid according to the, the, the script executes and returns true. And then you check that the, um, the inputs have not already been spent. But these are actually two different topics. Okay. A transaction validity is, if a transaction is valid, then it is valid for every block that follows the block at which you validated it. Down the tree, it continues to be valid. Um, what may not continue to be true is that the inputs are available. They might be spent by, by another transaction. So by separating these two, two items out, we can uh, optimize the system. We can do um, double spend protection or, or input availability checking right at the last stage where it's absolutely necessary. For optimization purposes, of course, we'll do it earlier, right? If you submit a transaction that was spent a year ago, it won't even enter the system. But, but for the last final check, um, that can be isolated to a very specific part of the system. Um, the big picture. So before we start building this system, of course, we need to define the underlying um, components that we will be using, such as the messaging queue, the, uh, we talk about control versus data messages. Data messages can get large. They're designed to, 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 to take full transactions, um, large data support, streaming data support. When you start to receive a block, you don't want to wait to receive the whole thing. You want to start processing it immediately. Um, this is all built into the messaging um, um, design. Data stores, there are more than listed here, yeah. There's also like, for example, a peer store. Um, a transaction store, I don't really talk about mempool anymore. I talk about uh, the set of unconfirmed transactions, which can be really large. It does not necessarily fit in RAM. Calling it mempool is a bit, a bit of a misname um, in this system. The block store, we don't, Unlike the current system, we don't store the entire block. We store block headers, and we store information about the block, what transactions are in the block. UTX, UTXO store, store the UTXO set for every block. Okay. Now, of course, we'll have optimizations, right? If the block is 100 blocks old, then we can, we can dump the UTXO store. But by keeping the UTXO store for every block, we can rapidly switch from one chain to another in the, in, the, uh, in the event of a competition for a block. Um, then we have a, a set of what we call system, what I call systems, and each system will have several components within it, and these all interact together, the components within the system. 
but then the system itself has a, a well-defined um, output and input. So these, these are a couple of them. They're not all of them, obviously. We have a P2P system, which handles all of the connections with the P2P network. We have a chain tracker, which is vital. It checks the chain tip, all of the chain tips. Uh, transaction validator, block validator, block assembler. The P2P system, for example, consists of many separate components within it. There is, for example, a P2P communicator, which establishes a number of connections with the uh, peers. And then a P2P manager. There can be many P2P communicators. The P2P manager um, controls those communicators, directs them to connect to peers, um, coordinates between them. The P2P system is designed so that it is multi-instance. You can have several of these communicators you can geographically distribute the, the uh, P2P communicators. For example, if you had a fast network, global network, you could put a P2P communicator in New York and one in London and one, you know, and they will, um, um, they will share the connections between them and you can set the system up so that it will connect to the nearest, nearest ones. It will measure latency. Uh, the P2P system, it handles all of the communication on the P2P network. It handles acquiring transactions from other peers. It handles transmitting transactions to other peers. And it separates these from the rest of the system. The P2P layer in Bitcoin, as we know as well, is actually quite intensive. If you start increasing the number of connections you have, you get a lot of data coming into the system. Um, and, and the goal of these, of these systems is to, to separate the load, to stop the P2P system from uh, any load on there impacting the, the other components. Okay? So you can do the small world network. You can connect to thousands of uh, peers. And uh, that traffic there is, is localized to the P2P system. And out of the P2P system comes a stream of um, transactions that need validation. Right, that are passed on to the transaction validator. Uh, there's notifications about new blocks that's passed on to the chain tracker. The chain tracker will then instantiate, uh, will then direct the P2P system to retrieve the block if necessary. Um, there's a whole set of, uh, of message flows between these systems that, um, that together implement the, uh, the, the functions that we need. The, ball, the block assembler is, um, is where candidate blocks are built. It's uh, using uh, techniques that we've also deployed in Bitcoin, that we're also releasing in Bitcoin SV node soon, which is incremental block assembly so that we can continually uh, produce bigger blocks. Um, instead of starting from scratch each time, we, every time we need to give a block to a miner, we add a bit to it, the previous one. Um, and yeah. So where are we with these systems? The architecture is fairly well, design, uh, well defined. The high level design is also well understood. We have an experimental system up. So we've deployed that uh, on the main network because that has the most nodes and that's interesting to, ch to, um, to to measure and monitor the P2P system. We've um, deployed it also on the scaling test network. That's an interesting place to put it because of the high transaction volume. It's a different, different, um, um, different reasons to put it there. The experimental system right now is limited mainly to the P2P uh, system that I talked about earlier. It does connect to every single node that are on these networks. It does retrieve transactions. It does broadcast transactions back out again. Um, that's as far as we are with the experimental system. The experimental system is designed to, the, the intent is to make sure that, um, to verify that our design with messages of, of, of various types floating to the system actually works properly. It is not 
written to the type of quality expectations we would, we would uh, require for the final system. Yeah? It is not intended that the experimental system will morph into the final system. It's strictly prototype, strictly experimental to check that our design works as we expect it to. Uh, the P2P system is in development. So um, Steve mentioned earlier, I think, the, the lib BSVJ um, library. Um, that's, we'll be using parts of that for the P2P system. Um, and a, a further goal we'll be having, we, we've got this lined up, but Genesis work is taking priority right now, is to refactor parts of the Bitcoin SV node implementation um, so that we can reuse uh, critical um, functions from that, from that software in terminal. Uh, I'm thinking primarily of the script interpreter there, um, other consensus rule um, components so that we can uh, get a flying start with Turnod with those components. And I finished a little bit early. Thank you. <laughs>